So today's daf is Kuf Lamed Tet. We start on line two, on the second line, with a new piece about uh, half or three quarters of an amud worth of Agada. So we have Tanya, it says, Nabrait Rabbi Yosef ben Elisha Omer, Rabbi Yosef ben Elisha says, Imra'ita dor shetzarot rabot ba'ot alav. If you see a generation where there are many troubles falling upon it, say, Uvdok b'dayane Yisrael, you should go and test or investigate the judges of Israel. Shakol puranut sheba'ala olam. Lo ba'a ele bishvil dayane Yisrael, because all of the trouble that happens to the world happens because of the judges of Israel. Shinemar, um, as we know, Shimun, as we learn in the Pasuk, from Micha. Uh, shim, shim, ooh, I lost my place. Okay, Shim Unazot Rashi Bet Yaakov. Hear this, heads of the house of Jacob, Uktsine, Uktsine Bet Yisrael, and the princes of the house of Israel, Hamitavim Mishpat, who despise judge, justice, Viet Kola Yishara Yakeshu, Yakeshu actually, and all that is straight they bend. Okay, Bonet Zion Bedamim, they build. Zion, they're building uh, Israel with blood, Yerushalayim be'avla, and Jerusalem with uh, injustice, Rashi'a be'shochad yishpotu, the heads of the people judge with uh, bribery, the Kohanim be'mchir yoru, and the Kohanim instruct for a price, on v'ya ba'kesef iksomu, and the prophets only prophesy, or they only... Uh, yiksomu is a funny word because kesem is usually like tricks. You know, it doesn't mean real prophecy. It's talking about false prophets. So they, they do their tricks for money. But they rely on God and they say nothing bad is going to happen to us. That's what Micha says. We're going to be fine. Everything's going to be wonderful because Hashem is with us. Because we're, re- we're the religious people. So if it sounds familiar to you, it should. This is called uh, in a perennial problem of the Jewish people that the leaders um, who pervert justice still look like very religious people and they still present themselves as very religious people. And unfortunately, uh, you know, that's an even bigger chilul Hashem than the injustice that they're already doing, that they invoke God to support or to legitimize their bad behavior. Rishayim Hen, they're wicked people. The gem- yeah, well, or, or worse. You know, the whole, the, you know, many, many tiers and levels of the system. Not to point at any individual, because I don't think we have, we're in the position where we can um, really judge anybody, especially from afar. It's not fair to do that, but there are, there's certainly corruption in the system, you know, in, in the rabbinic, uh, in the rabbinic world. And certainly, you know, we see it in Israel, maybe writ large, we see it, you know, with what we hear in the news. But, you know, it's pervasive. It's all around, unfortunately. And, with, you know, although it's it's difficult to fairly judge any particular case, we definitely know that there's a fair share of corruption in there, unfortunately. So, Rishayimen, they're wicked people. They're wicked people, but they place their trust in the one who spoke and the world came into existence. In other words, they put their trust in God, or they claim to put their trust in God, even though if they really trusted God, they would do the right thing and expect God to uh, bless them anyway. Instead, they pervert justice for their own gain. Therefore, God brings upon them Three punishments which correspond to the three sins that are in their hands. So it says, therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem will be like ruins or like you know abandoned uh, places, uh, and that the har habayit, the um, the uh, Temple Mount will be a Bamot Ya'ar, like the high, literally what that means is like the high places of the forest. But you know, in other words, what it's trying to say is abandoned and destroyed and this is what's going to happen. And the Hashem will not place his divine presence on Israel until the wicked, uh, uh, the, the, the wicked judges and Officers of Israel are eliminated. The officers are those who implement the judgments of the wicked uh, of the wicked judges. Shenemar, as it says, Vashiva yadi alaich veetzroch kabor I will place my hand over you, and I will refine 
your uh, impurities. And I will take out all of the uh, all of the extra stuff. In other words, all of the bad stuff that uh, all of the impurities, all of the uh, all of the negative. And then I will return your judges as of old and your advisors as in the beginning. So this is actually, I believe, the haftarah for. Um, for uh, Tisha B'Av, for uh, this is the end of Shabbat Chazon Haftara, which talks about how Hashem is going to purify, as with soap or as with uh, caustic cleaner, will clean out, will cleanse the Jewish people of all their impurities and all their defilement, and return their leaders as days of old, implying that what is the what's the implication of the pasuk that the defi- the defilement or the the negative is the bad judges, because it's saying I'm going to get rid of your defilement and I'm going to replace the judges with good judges. Amar Ula Ula says, "Ein Yerushalayim nifdel b'tzdaka." Some have the girsa, the version of "Ein Yisrael nifdel b'tzdaka." The Jewish people will not be redeemed, or is, or Jerusalem. Same idea, will only be redeemed with tzedaka, with charity or justice. Shneemar Tzion ba Mishpat Yipade, because Tzion Zion will be redeemed with Mishpat, with justice, v'shavet b'tzdaka, and those who return to it b'tzdaka with charity or with kindness but it comes from the same word as tzedek doing the right thing if the arrogant people would disappear then those who entice the Jewish people to idolatry and to wicked activity would also disappear. If the bad judges would disappear, then the oppressors who harm us would disappear. How do we know that if the arrogant people would disappear, then those who incite us to wickedness and to idolatry would disappear? Because that's the Pasuk in Yeshayahu that says that what is going to save the Jewish people from their low state, it's going to be when I re- replace your bad leaders with good leaders. When you have arrogant leaders, arrogant leaders are not interested in um, helping the people to steer clear from bad influences. In fact, it helps them when there are bad influences because the people who are under the bad influence are easier to manipulate and to, to, uh, uh, to convince to join their evil cause. So that's why if you had really good and proper leaders, then all of those who are, uh, who are involved in uh, wickedness and are enticing others to wickedness will not have the ability, won't be given the leeway to exert their influence anymore. But that's certainly true. And then we see that but that if you get rid of the bad... Um, ju- judges, you'll get rid of the oppressors. When it says Hashem will remove, well, I'm sorry, it's, it's not mishpatecha. It's, it's actually Hayisir Hashem mishpatech. Pina oy vech that Hashem will remove your uh, your ju- your judgments, which means your bad ju- judges, and will get rid of your enemies. In other words, when Hashem gets rid of the uh, bad judges, the bad uh, you know the enemies are removed as well. Amar Rabbi Milai, Rabbi Milai says Mishum Rabbi Elazar Rabbi Shimon. In the name of Rabbi Elazar Rabbi Shimon, my dichtiv. What does it mean in the pasuk when it says that Shavar Hashem Mater Shaim? That Hashem has broken the stick of the wicked, the staff of the leaders. What is this referring to? So the, now the, he explains each part. Shavar Hashem Mater Shaim. What does it mean that he broke the stick of the wicked? Elu Adayanim Shenasu Makala Hazanehim. These are the Dayanim. Uh, these are the judges that become a stick for. Their chazanim, in other words, their workers end up ruling over them. They and Rashi explains that their assistants um, uh, will will manipulate them. In other words, the the whole system is corrupt because, as Rashi says, that lishama shehen, those who are supposed to serve the judges, end up being their masters. How so? Because vavyan and the chozek lo mar lo eh yeshaliach vazmin et ploni lebedin im lo tarbe sachar vachar pesagdin lo lo erdenu lekanes lemashkino. Because the, those who are working for the judges will say to the judges, we're not going to work for you unless you pay us big bucks. Now that you have to pay us a lot of money, we're not, gonna, we're not going to summon this guy to the judgment. We're not going to impose the judgment unless you pay us more. So because they're demanding a lot of money, what happens? The Dayan is in trouble unless he makes the money to be able to pay them. So what's going to happen? So he has to take bribes. He has to become corrupt because he has to, uh, he has to be able to pay off those... Who are keeping order. Now, what does it mean, Shevet Moshlim? What does it mean that the, the uh, staff of the leaders? So, 
These are Tamidei Chachamim who are in the families of the wicked judges. Why? Because they lend legitimacy. So Rashi explains that these are, they are the ones that the Tamidei Chachamim and their family uh, help them get into their position and help justify or legitimize their position because people know, oh, this is the brother of uh, Rabbi so-and-so. Oh, this is so the, like the nepotism that we see today. The same thing happens today. But you have a lot of nepotism going on and these people might not really be fit for their position, but always oh, the brother of this and the cousin of that one and the uncle this and they put him into the position because of that. And so we hold them responsible. They are the Shevet Muslim. In other words, they are the, they are the empowerers of, they're the ones who empower really the... Um, Yep. Uh, the uh, the bad judges. So the the bad judges end up being tools of their underlings sometimes because they have to pay their overhead and all that. And the uh, and sometimes the talmidei chachamim become the empowerers or the you know the ones who give empowerment to the wicked judges because they lend legitimacy to them through nepotism and other such things that are very unfortunate. Marzutra Marzutra says Elu Tamidei Chachamim Shem Lamdim Halachot Sibor LeDayne Bor. These are the Tamidei Chachamim who teach the laws of how to run the community to fools, to bad judges. In other words, what happens? They give smicha basically. Rashi says She Behavtachat Otan Tamidei Chachamim Ma Midin Dayane Bor. In other words, what it means is like this, that if you teach students and you, you, you give students smicha, basically, you ordain students who are not qualified, and then they go out and teach, and people say, oh, well, he's a student of Rav uh, so-and-so, he must be a great, uh, uh, great judge, but really, he taught somebody who was a fool, why? Probably either because of social pressure, or because he got paid well to do it, or whatever the reason is. Okay, but everybody will say, oh, this, this judge here, he must be uh, great because he's a student of whoever. And really that judge doesn't know what he's doing and he messes everything up. So, uh, the, and, so that's what Mars Trust is it's referring to. So that, that Talmud Chacham, who originally taught the, um, who originally taught the bad judge is actually contributing. He might say, what am I doing? I just taught Torah to this guy. I didn't do anything. No, by giving your name to that guy. And supporting him and enabling him. You're an enabler. And by being an enabler, basically what you end up doing is contributing to the corruption and the general uh, uh, you know, destruction exactly of the system. The Torah means when it says a shohad ya'aver, David said he came. That's, yeah, it can, it can, it, yeah. It, it blinds the, uh, the, the, the wisest of all of us. Yeah. And, and, and many times today you'll say, oh, the Yeshiva University has thousands of Muslim you know, who really can tell whether they're... You know, every every single one of them is a tzaddik. I mean, how do they know? I'm not saying that they're not, but you know, yeah. How do they know? Well, you know, we need enrollment to be X Y Z, and you know, I'm not saying that that's that the people who come out of there are bad. Maybe I, I hope they're not. I hope they're all great, but definitely, it's just, it's just impossible to tell. To keep, right, it's impossible to tell. No. There are too many, and the institution has to survive by numbers, and it's it's a problem. So Amar Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Eliezer ben Milai, Rabbi Eliezer ben Milai says, Mishum Reish Lakish in the name of Reish Lakish, my dichtiv. What does it mean in the pasuk when it says? And this is a pasuk from Yeshayahu, ki kapechem negualu badam, vetzbotechem ba'avon, that your hands are uh, dirty with blood, and your fingers with sin. Sifzotechem diberu sheker, your, your lips speak falsehood, lishonechem avlatege, and your, your tongue uh, mutters or meditates on injustice. So this doesn't sound like a very uh, complimentary pasuk. What is this talking about? So first, what does it mean that your hands are dirty with blood? This is, these are the dayanim, the judges who are corrupt. And your fingers are dirty with sin. These are the secretaries of the judges who write up the piskedin. In other words, everybody who's involved in the system is responsible for their part in it. So they write up the uh, conclusions and the proceedings of the courts. Your lips speak falsehood. These are the lawyers, my friends. Even back then, they knew that. Now, back, now in those days, litigants did not necessarily have a lawyer speak for them in court, but the lawyers, the orchea dayanim, literally means those who set up the judges. That's what, and even in, even in Hebrew today, it's called an orechtin. Somebody who sets up the judgment, okay, who sets up the judgment, or now they called it, today it's called orech din, which means the person who sets up the judgment, meaning he arranges the case. There it's called orchea dayanim, the person who sets up 
the judge. Because what would you do? You know, if you had a good lawyer who could give you the right arguments, the litigant would appear himself in court. But if he's, you know, he, he, the, the Orech Din or the, or, the Orech Dayan would teach him how to manipulate the judge by presenting his case in a certain way that wasn't very truthful, but he knew would win the case. And today it's called? That's a lawyer. Orech Din, same thing. I mean, basically the same thing, but they call it Orech Din instead of Orech Dayan. It's more, per, it's more relating to the person. Orech Dayan means that you're, you're setting, setting up, the up the judge, you know? Finding the judge. Which, yeah, which often, you know, probably is one, it's two ways of saying the same thing, pretty much. But, exactly. Yeah, I mean, but, but you know, but they, they, even in Perkei Avot, it talks about the Orche Dayanim. Don't be like the Orche Dayanim. Because, so it comes in, it says, hey, judge, this is the way you ought to be thinking. Well, you know, the, the way that they argue cases in front of the, in any court. You know, a lawyer knows how to pick the right precedents and line up the facts a certain way. A, a, a judge is a human being, so a judge is influenced by the way things are presented to him. Right. And, also, and, and also rules on, I mean, in our system it's different because in, the, in, in that system, the Dayan is really supposed to be responsible for making the decision. The truth. Right. And so he really has to bring his own... Uh, thoughts to bear more on the process. Um, so, it's, but but still, somebody who presents a case to you a certain way, just like in any field, if you're a psychologist, if you're a if you're a doctor, um, you know this is a this is a problem that when you see someone else's evaluation of the case, it shapes the way that you look at the case for sure. And there are many situations. There's a doctor, a great doctor called uh, Jerome Groupman, who writes a lot of. Um, uh, he's actually an observant Jew, but he writes a lot of books about medicine and uh, some great books. And one he has uh, called How Doctors Think. And he speaks about how a prior diagnosis can prevent a, a later doctor from actually correctly diagnosing because they just assume that, you know, they just interpret everything in terms of the framework that was given to them. It's a fascinating book, by the way. It's a little disturbing, but fascinating. Um, the what is it called? How Doctors Think. It's in soft cover now. It's a good book. Um, a- anyway, the, 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 the yeah. person that wouldn't have a lawyer to spin the case. Right. He doesn't even have a lawyer. But, you know, in our system today, let's say if they argue cases before the Supreme Court, usually um, the, judge, the justices are deciding on the arguments presented to them. Um, but it's still you know, the arguments. Not it's still the arguments, the not truth. necessarily the ultimate truth. Right. Now, to what extent is a Supreme Court justice or a, or a judge allowed to bring their own thoughts to bear in the case? I'm not really sure if they're only permitted to rule. It always seems like the arguments presented to them are the ones that they end up deciding on. And anything beyond the immediate arguments presented to them, they don't necessarily look at. But I'm not sure if that's really ha- if it has to be that way. And anyway, that's what it's talking about here. And lishonchem avlat tege elo bale dinin the um, your your lips. Uh, meditate injustice. These are the litigants themselves, because we know that the litigants obviously play a part in misrepresenting their case when they participate together with the lawyer in manufacturing a case that is most likely to uh, bring them out on top. And Rabbi Milai said in the name of Rabbi Yitzchak Migdala that um, uh, this doesn't have anything directly to do with what we're talking about so far except that Rebbe Milai who is somebody that I've never heard of before and, uh, or that I can't remember hearing of because he's not very common in the, in the Shas he has a, an extra you know has an, another statement here so it's appended here so he said from the day that Yosef left his brothers he never drank any wine the forehead of Nezir Echav Nezir Echav literally means the one who separated from his brothers but calling Yosef a Nazir implies that he didn't drink wine. Like a Nazir doesn't drink wine. And Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Hanina, Amar Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Hanina says, Afhen lo tamu tam yayin. Even the other brothers didn't eat, drink any wine. Dikhtiv vayishtu vayishkeru imo. Miklal da'ada idana lo. That it says that they drank and they became drunk with Yosef that last night before he uh, set up Binyamin with the cup. Okay, so it says that they drank and they got drunk with him, implying that they also didn't drink wine. So according to Rabbi Milai, it was only it was only Yosef who didn't drink wine during all those years, as long as he was separated from his brothers. According to Rabbi Yossi, even the brothers themselves didn't drink any wine from the minute that Yosef left them, and they realized they had made a mistake and they felt uh, that they needed to do penance or whatever you want to call it for all those years. So Idach, what about according to Rabbi Milai? Does, why doesn't he agree that the brothers abstained from wine also during those years? It just means that they never got drunk. But but they did drink. In other words, they, were, they didn't abstain from wine like a Nazir. It was just that they didn't get drunk all those years because they were never able to feel fully 
confident, fully comfortable, fully happy with themselves to be able to uh, release their inhibitions in that way. But according to him, Yosef saw himself as an Azir who oh. had to make up for something whatever it was. Maybe he was either working on himself because he recognized that he must have been responsible for it or right. or somehow, uh, yeah, it could be in some way trying to rise above because we know that what that in, if you think about it, I mean, it makes some sense uh, midrashically that, you know, Yosef would be a Nazir because we know that Yosef was a, a person who was young and very impressed with his good looks right. and had women after him. And we know that part of what the Nazir does is not cut his hair because... He wants to be able to neglect his appearance because he realizes that concerns about image mm-hmm. and concerns about you know and drinking of wine lead to a life of uh, funny to do this uh, would pleasure. Do the yeah, well, that's the style. But so yeah. even though he seemed to be a victim, he yeah. was also taking responsibility. Yeah, it seems like it was, was that went on with him. Yeah, it sounds like what they're saying. And Nazir fits with fits. Yeah, it fits with the concept of what Yosef was like because the whole idea of of the Nazir is really somebody who's trying to avoid this the sensual life mm-hmm. or to avoid excesses in sensual life by abstaining from wine primarily but also from abstaining by abstaining from grooming the self I mean even the ones who have long hair today they don't leave it ungroomed you know they get it styled and everything and it's not exactly the same um, and one other thing from Rabbi Milai this is for this week's parasha very, uh, very apt that because it tells us that uh, when Moshe Rabbeinu is chosen to be the, the redeemer to go into Egypt Hashem tells him, Aharon is going to meet you, Vera'achan is going to see you, Bisamach Belibon, he's going to be very happy. Don't think he's going to be hurt that as the older brother he didn't get chosen. He's not going to be hurt, he's going to be happy, he's going to be thrilled for you and thrilled for the Jewish people, and that's it. Vera'achan is going to even in his heart. He's not just going to pretend to like you, he's going to be really happy. So, because he genuinely was happy for his brother, he didn't have any resentment, he didn't say, hey, why not me? Why did you pass over me? I'm jealous. Because of that, he got the Choshen HaMishpat, he got the Choshen on his heart. That's why the Kohen Gadol wears the Choshen HaMishpat. The special breastplate of the Kohen Gadol represents this good-heartedness of Aharon, that he was concerned more with the Jewish people. He didn't think about himself or about his own lost opportunity to be the Moshe Rabbeinu. He recognized it wasn't meant to be. The people of the town of Bashkar sent some she'elot, some questions to Levi. Kila mahu. What is the deal with a, a bed canopy on Shabbat? We learned about this yesterday, right? Putting a canopy over the bed on Shabbat. And they asked him, Kashuta bekarba mahu. Can you plant hops that you, you know that you make beer from? Can you plant that in a kerem? In a vineyard, because a vineyard, you're not allowed to have diverse seeds. The question is, are hops considered a plant or are they considered a tree? If they're considered a tree, you're allowed to plant a tree in a vineyard, but you're not allowed to plant other kinds of plants in a vineyard. And they asked him, if somebody passes away, God forbid, on Yom Tov, what is the What can we do with the person? Unfortunately, before the questions got, this is the benefit of email and texting, you know, before the question got to Levi, he had passed away already. Mm. So he didn't get the chance to answer it. I'm sure that was the case with many uh, Rabbanim, that they, you know, there were many questions left unanswered. You know, they, they were answering Shailot uh, their, their whole life. So Amar Shmuel Rav Menashia. So Shmuel said to Rav Menashia, I hakimat shalach lehum. If you're smart enough, this is, talk about a challenge, you know. If you're smart enough to answer the questions, answer them. In other words, Levi can't answer them anymore, obviously. He passed away. Now you answer them. So he did. Shalach lehu, he says. So uh, he, he sent them as follows. Kila, chazanu al kol tzidei kila velo matzinu lahet tzad heter. He sent back the following message. We've examined every possibility, every side of the issue of making a bed, a bed canopy, you know, this draped uh, curtain over the bed, and we haven't, find any, we haven't found a, a, any way to permit it. So the Gemara says, wait a second. Didn't we just learn yesterday that Rami Bar Yechezkel said that there is a situation, there is a way that you can make a, as long as it's sloped at a certain angle and it's not a tefach and everything. But yeah, that there was a way that you could actually have 
a legitimate canopy over the bed and it wouldn't be considered making a tent. Yeah, but the, but the implication of that at the end was that it's it was very so difficult. But that, that no, unless they did it in uh, stages and they, they did little ones. It was right, unless they did little ones like Rashi says, yeah. Right. right, but still, why didn't he answer that? So, Lafish Enan B'nai Torah, because they're not such Tabidei Chachamim, they're not so smart in Bashkar. If I give them a, if you give them an inch, they take a mile. Uh, right? So they're not going to understand nuance. If I tell them, oh yeah, it's okay, but with all these restrictions, they're just going to say, okay, it's all right, it's okay. Right. Right? They're, they're not going to get the nuance. So, kashuta becharma irvuva. You know what? Hops in a vineyard, you can't do it. It's considered mixed seeds. You can't do it. Why didn't you tell them the position of Rabbi Tarfon? It says in the Kishut, Rabbi Tarfon, Omer, Kishot. So, Haps, Rabbi Tarfon says, En Kilaim Bakerem. Vachachamim Omrim Kilaim Bakerem. So, there's a machloket actually. The rabbis say you're not allowed to plant hops in a vineyard. Rabbi Tarfon says you can. And what do we say? We have a principle, and we have a general principle. That whoever is the most lenient position with regard to the halacha when it comes to kilayim, when it comes to diverse seeds, in Israel it's deoraita, it's biblically prohibited. So we go by the stringent opinion. Outside of Israel we go by the most lenient opinion. Always. So why didn't he tell them Rabbi Tarfon says it's okay? Answer, again, because they're not so religious and they're not so knowledgeable. I don't want to give them too many leniencies because they're going to pull, they're going to push it too far. Machriz Rav, Rav, Rav announced in his city, Hayman de Ba'el Mizra Kashuta Becharma Lizra. In Rav's city, where people were more knowledgeable, and he also was in Chutzar, he was in Babel, in Babylonia, he said, anybody who wants to plant hops in their vineyard, it's fine. So his, his community, in other words, really, that was the halacha. The halacha was, you're allowed to do it, but you can't always give the most lenient halacha to people who will misunderstand it and misapply it. So he was being a responsible leader. He was, exactly. So, so that explains a little bit when Shmuel said to him, if you're smart, answer them. Right? Answer the questions that they sent. In other words, it's not just a matter of, do you know the answer? I know the answer. But you have to be responsible at a different level. You have to understand the questioner. And this is something rabbis deal with all the time, by the way. You have to understand who you're being asked by, not just what you're being asked in order to answer correctly. So, Rav Amram Chasida, Rav Amram Chasida, Rav Amram the pious, who was also, who's best known for the incident in Masechet Kiddushin, where he put a ladder and started climbing up to look at the girls, and then he realized he was doing something bad, so he cried, fire, fire, and everybody came. That's Rav Amram Chasida, the famous story. But that's not what he's doing here. Mangid Ilave. He would subject anybody to lashes who did that. In other words, if somebody in his community planted hops together in a vineyard, he would consider it mixed seeds and he would give them lashes. In other words, in his community, obviously, they needed extra chizuk. They weren't able to have this leniency. They needed a little more reinforcement. Rav Mesharshia, Yaivle, Perutalatinok, Nochri, Vizarale. So Rav Mesharshia had a, uh, a compromise. He didn't do it himself, but he would give some money to a non Jewish kid and have the non Jewish kid plant it. So he said, I didn't plant it. So then they said, well, Velitinli, Le, Litinok, Israel. Why doesn't he just give it to a, Jew, a Jewish kid? Okay, so Rashi explains what's the reason for this subterfuge here. It says, Bachutz Aretz Shari, it's really permitted. But as much as you can distance yourself from doing it, it's better. So people won't, in other words, if you do it in a roundabout way, you can tell people it's permitted, but it's really not recommended, so I'm going to do it in a roundabout way. That encourages people to still be conservative about the issue, even when you're relying on the leniency. So you would have a kid do it. But why didn't he pick a Jewish kid? Because... Because Atel Mishach, because then when he becomes an adult, he's going to do it. Why don't you give it to a, an adult non-Jew? Because then people will think he gave it to another Jew to do it. So basically, he did it with a child who was non-Jewish, so people would say, I'm distancing myself from the action, so don't take it too far. Even though it's really permitted. So now, met. Uh, what about the question of somebody who dies on Yom Tov? Shalach leho. He said to them, met lo it askube lo yudayin velo armayin lo biyom tov rishon velo biyom tov sheni. You should not bury a dead person on Yom Tov. Not the first day, not the second day, not with Jews and not with non-Jews. Don't do any burial on Yom Tov whatsoever. Any is that true? The Amar Rabbi Yehuda Bar Shelat Amar Rabbi Asi Rabbi Rabbi Yehuda Bar Shelat said that Rabbi Asi said Uvdahava Bevei Kenishda De Maon. There was once a situation in the Bet Knesset of Maon. The Yom Tov was a Mochle Shabbat, and it was Yom Tov that was attached to Shabbat. In other words, Velo Yadan Na Imi Lefanei Imi Laachareha. 
either it was a Friday Yom Tov leading into Shabbat, or it was a Shabbat leading into a Yom Tov, and the Yom Tov was on Sunday. Either way, you had two consecutive days, holy days, and and they went to Rabbi Yochanan and he said to them, he said, get non-Jews to do the burial. Because you don't want to leave the, the dead around for two days. In other words, either this person died and it was Shabbat, and then it was Yom Tov afterwards, so it was going to be a two-day delay. So he said, just have non-Jews do it. Or he died on Yom Tov, which was followed by a Shabbat. So Rabbi Yochanan said, we better bury him today on Yom Tov. We don't want to leave it to Shabbat. Just have non-Jews do it. Who would do Tov I guess it would supervise the non-Jews doing it. Vama Ravan Rava said, Met Yom Tov Rishon Yitaskubo Amamin. If somebody dies on Yom Tov Rishon... Non-Jews should take care of it. Yom Tov Sheni, on Yom Tov Sheni, it asku bo Yisrael. Vafilu Yom Tov Sheni shal Rosh Hashanah. Then Jews can actually do the burial eve, even on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Mashe en ken babitza, which is not the case with an egg. What does that mean? Which is not the case with an egg. Normally, if an egg is born on the first day, this is the very first Mishnah of the second bitza. Actually, if an egg is born on, on uh, Yom Tov, the first day, then the second day you can eat it. Second day of Yom Tov. Why? Because if it was because if the first day was Yom Tov and the second day is really weekday, so it's okay. And if the first day was weekday and the second day is really Yom Tov, so it was born on a weekday, so it's no problem. But on Rosh Hashanah we don't apply that rule. On Rosh Hashanah we both we treat both days as equally serious. So even if an egg was born on day one of Rosh Hashanah, we don't eat it on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, and vice versa. Okay. In other words, it doesn't matter whether it was born. Let's say you have a, you know, uh, we don't use the suffix. We don't say that, well, something that was born on the first day of Yom Tov, it might have been weekday. So we can eat it on the second day. We don't say that it might have, that it was a holy day and today is weekday, the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So we can eat it on the second day. We don't, we don't apply that rule. Okay. We don't consider it a doubt. We consider it a definite. But still, with regard to burial, we allow you to bury on the second day of Rosh Hashanah with non-Jews. Okay, so I'm sorry. If it's the first day of a holiday with with non-Jews, if it's the second day, even the Jews can do it. The second day of Rosh Hashanah. Even the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we we treat more leniently, even though normally we don't treat it more leniently than the first day. Here we do treat it more leniently. That's why it's say otherwise it would be the same as Yom. Tov. It wouldn't mention Rosh Hashanah as an exception because it would be the same as Yom Tov Rishon both days. So it's telling you know you treat the second day of Rosh Hashanah like a second day Yom Tov lesser, uh, even though we don't usually treat it as a, as less than the first day. So, the, um, of course, the custom today in America is not to do this uh, because of many complications, like I mentioned a day or two ago. Because, you know, people will drive to the uh, funeral, people will, uh, you know, there are other issues that are involved. And also, Rav Moshe, Feinstein said, Rav Moshe Feinstein said that now we have, you know, refrigeration, refrigeration. we're not as worried about the body, um, you know, being disgraced. However, in the Hasidic communities in Brooklyn and stuff, they still do it. They still have funerals on Second Day Yom Tov. There was, unfortunately, a case where there was a fire that broke out in Yom Tov uh, several years back of one of the... Somebody who was a member of a rabbinic dynasty, I think, the, the woman who died. They, they had a whole bunch of Yom Tov candles set up under their ca- you know, next to their cabinet, and it caught fire, and a lot of people died. It was sad. A few people died. And uh, they had the funeral on Second Day Yom Tov in Brooklyn. And, you know... The press came and took pictures of it, of course, you know, because it was unusual, but um, they, they did that. So why then did Rav, why did Rav Menashe tell them never to do a funeral on Yom Tov, not first day, not second day, if the halakha is that on the first day you can do it by non-Jews, and on the second day you're allowed to do it even with the Jews? Again, the fish inan b'nei Torah, because they are not b'nei Torah, they were not knowledgeable in Torah, they were not especially religious or pious, and therefore he was afraid to give them leniency that they might take too far. Okay. Now, interestingly, Rashi holds that the whole idea of burying on Yom Tov is only true when there is a two-day delay, like in the case that we just read, when there's a Shabbat before the Yom Tov, or where there's a Shabbat, where there's Shabbat after the Yom Tov. However, most of the poskim hold that it applies in any case, that really, in theory, we could bury on Yom Tov Rishon through non-Jews, and on Yom Tov Sheni through uh, Jews also. And Rabbeinu Tam on the side says an interesting thing. It says there that uh, in their time... And there were some people who allowed this, and Rabbi Nutam got really upset. Not just because people went on horses to the funeral. So you see, they had the same problem. Travel. Right? So, not just because that. Even, on the people, even the people who went on foot, he was upset about. And he says, because if they see the Jews doing work on Yom Tov, they're going to try to press them into other work. Because what do we always tell the, the, our bosses? Sorry, it's Shabbat, it's Yom Tov, I can't work. 
What, 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 oh, but what do you mean? I saw Chaim. He went to the, you know, the, the funeral, and he was digging right in the dirt. What do you mean you can't you, you can't work? I want you to work in my field on Yom Tov. No, I can't work. You, I saw you with my own eyes. So you're going to get everyone in trouble. And Rabbi Nutam says, if the people of Bashkar were not B'nai Torah, he says, are our people B'nai Torah? Our people are so religious and knowledgeable that they're any better? Certainly not. Okay, so. Said that Rav Chama Bar Guria said mitatef adam bakila ube kaskaseha. He says that a person can wear the kila, so the curtain that you would use to make the canopy over the bed. Normally, it's not usually clothing, but if you wanted to wear it as a cloak, even though it has straps hanging from it that are usually used to tie it down to the bed, you can wear it as a cloak. And you can go out into the public domain. And we don't say, and we say, we're not worried, we're not concerned that these straps hanging off are considered extra and you're carrying them. So Why is it that this is not the same as the other case that we have? That if a person goes out into the Rishut Rabim on Shabbat and he's wearing a talit and this talit has tzitzit that are improperly done. For example, only three of the corners have tzitzit on them. Or whatever other issue you might have. So he goes out in the Rishut Rabim wearing this. It's considered carrying. Why? Because the three tzitzit are are extra. They're not doing any function. They're not doing any function because they because the, it's not done properly. Because the fourth one is missing. Let's say. So, why is that any different here? The straps are not serving any function. The straps are used for tying it down to the bed. So you have extraneous stuff hanging off of the garment. You're wearing a blanket, basically. You're wearing, a, you know, a canopy of a bed. So they answered that no, that tzitzit legabetalit chashive velo Tzitzit are considered very significant. So you're caught in a kind of a catch-22. Because they're significant for the mitzvah. Because most likely you're going to add that fourth corner and complete the garment and you're going to make it a full talit. You're not going to leave it the way that it is. So because of that, they have a great significance. And since they have a great... But the problem is, with all their great significance, they're not serving a function right now. So it's like you're carrying them. Because on one hand, you attribute significance to these tzitzit because they're part of the mitzvah and eventually you're going to complete the tzitziot on the garment. But on the other hand, right now, they're not functioning. What Where, if they say that, that he could be wearing the tzitzit because he, uh, even with, with three uh, corners, that because he's cold and, and, and wants to uh, so, cover himself. Yeah, so. so that serves a function. Right, but, nice. the talus, but, but, the, but the tzitzit, tzitzit are the problem. Right. The strings hanging off. Oh, the strings. Yeah, the strings. Are being carried. Yeah, they're getting carried. Yeah. Uh, you don't have four. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Right. So Rashi so says. Rashi thing? says it's because of techelet, which would mean that today it wouldn't apply. Right. But the other Rishonim say no. It's because it, it's because you have three, let's say, instead of four. Right. So or or because some of them are cut or whatever. Why the big deal out of the significance of it? I mean, why not just say, well, it's not three, it's not four, it's three, so it's extra. Because if it were not as significant, like um, then it wouldn't like really be considered blanket. carrying. You wouldn't say, oh, that guy's carrying uh, some wisp of uh, of. But for the blanket, cloth. you can. For the canopy, you can. Right. So that's what it, that's the problem. Well, Another. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. So the so with a talit, we say, oh, look, he's carrying tzitzit because since the, those strings actually have a lot of significance because they're part so of the mitzvah. So you notice that you rec- it's recognizable. That's a significant thing. The straps are, when the person's using it as a garment, they're just, you know, hanging off there, whatever. You, sometimes you have wisps of, you know, stuff on the talit. It just hangs off. Uh, that's nothing. So why can the tzitziot be considered? But because the tzitziot, tzitziot, exactly. So because, but because the tzitziot are probably going to be repaired and they're fu- and to fulfill the mitzvah. Then, that time then yeah, now we're looking. So it's, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the essence so of the so point here. here. Right. So now, Amar Rabba Barafuna, Rabba Barafuna says, now let's see what is the correction in the Bach he has. Um, that Rabbah should be gone from this, and it should just be Amar Ravuna, I guess. Ma'arim adam ala mishamiret biyom tov litlot ba rimonim v'toleba shimarim. Now we learned in the Mishnah that according to the Chachamim, you're not allowed to set up a strainer on Yom Tov, and you're not allowed to use it on Shabbat. Remember, so they said you can't even set it up. You're not allowed to stretch the cloth. What they would do is stretch a cloth over a container and then put the dregs on that cloth and then the wine would drip through. 
So you're not allowed to do that in Yom Tov. He says, however, if you wanted to do it, you could do subterfuge. And what you do is you hang the cloth on there and you, to hold a pomegranate. You wanted to hold the pomegranate on the cloth. Or you wanted to hold fruit on there. So you, you put it on there. And then you say, oh, see, I, oh, you know what? While I have it here, I'll use it now. Now, on Yom Tov, you're allowed to strain the wine anyway because it's for food. But you're not allowed to make a strainer. But you put the cloth there and you said, oh, I, I didn't put this here as a strainer. I just put this here to hold my fruit. This cloth. And then you say, oh, now that I have it there, I might as well use it as a strainer. So you're doing subterfuge. So, they, so he says, you're allowed to do that. So, ma, so Amar Ravashi Ravashi says, But you have to actually use it for the Rimonim. You can't just say, oh yeah, I'm going to use it for putting pomegranates and put the, set the strainer up, set the cloth strainer up. You have to actually set this cloth up and actually put pomegranate on there. So the Gemara asks, how is this different from what we learned in a bright that you're allowed to make beer during Chola Moed if it's for the purposes of the festival but you can't make beer during the festival for after the festival because you're just preparing for after Yom Tov even on Chola Moed you're not allowed to do that Okay, it doesn't matter if it's date beer or it's barley beer. Even if he has old beer, he can go back and drink as long as he's going to drink a little bit of the new beer. It's okay. He can make a huge batch of new beer, even though he's got plenty of old beer in stash. But he can uh, he can make a new beer and drink later on. He drinks a little bit of it and says, "See, I needed it for Yom Tov." Even though really he knows that he made it for afterwards. <laughs> so the Gemara says, so, so the question is, here in the case of the Rimon, what do we say? He's, you're telling me, Rav Ashi, that I actually have to, when I put the cloth on, I have to put the pomegranate right away to make it clear that this was to hold a pomegranate and it wasn't as a strainer. Okay? But in the case of the guy who makes beer, when he's making the beer, there's no evidence that he needs it for right now. By all evidence, he doesn't need it right now. Because we know that he has a stash of beer already. And okay, later on he's going to come drink a little bit from the new beer. But the fact is that right now when he's doing it, it looks like he's just making beer for after Yom Tov. So why is it not, why is it that in your case you insisted that he put the pomegranate, as he's doing it, he's got to put the pomegranate on there. While in the case of beer, we, we don't require that. <clears throat> and the Gemara says, the Gemara says, Hatam lo mochamilta. Because when it comes to beer making, okay, so there Raji explains what does it mean? It's not obvious in the case of beer that he's doing it, that he's doing anything wrong. Because nobody knows what you have in your cellar. We don't know what you have in your beer cellar. So it's not obvious. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. If I see the guy making the new beer, I'll assume he's doing it for now. However, when it comes to the pomegranate, what does it look like? It looks very obvious that you're making a strainer unless you put the pomegranate as you're doing it. There has to be something in the action that makes it clear. In the case of beer, giving someone the benefit of the doubt, I don't see anything wrong with what he's doing because I don't really know what he's got in the bank. You know, I don't know what, how much in his beer bank is available. Um, but in the case of the strainer construction there, we have to do something as we're setting up the strainer so, so the that it's not, so that it's clear. People. Right. In other words, it has to be... It has to be demonstrated, basically, manifest, manifest in the action itself that it's being done for a permitted purpose. And then even if the person's intention is not really permitted, it's okay, as long as in the action itself. So in the case of making the beer, as long as he takes a little bit of the beer afterwards to drink it um, for, during the Yom Tov, it legitimizes everything that he did. Even though in his mind, it's long term, it's really for later. It's not really for the Yom Tov. But in the action itself, he doesn't have to do anything to manifest that is his intention for right now. Because in his action itself, we would give him the benefit of the doubt. But the person who sets up the strainer, his action itself needs, it needs to be manifest. Because otherwise, we're going to look at that action objectively as just constructing a strainer. So we have to look at both his intention and at what his action looks like in that case. And that's why he has to put the pomegranate as he's doing it in that case. Amru le Rabbanan Ravashi. The rabbi said to Ravashi, Chazem mar hai tzurvame Rabbanan v'rav huna b'rabi chivan shime. Has the, the master seen a certain rabbinic student? And his name is Rav Huna, uh, the son of Rav Chivan. And some say it's Rabbi Rav Huna, the son of Rabbi Chilavon. That he took a thing of garlic, okay? 
and a, you know a uh, a piece of garlic. Umanach be barzad de dana va'amar la atznu e kamechavena ve'azil. Oh, I'm sorry, kamechavena. That what he did was he wanted to plug up. There was some leakage from one of his barrels of wine, so he took a garlic and he stuck it in there to plug it. So he made a plug. That would be like a type of construction because you know he's fi- he's fixing it, he's fixing the the leak. So, but he said, no, no, I just want to save my garlic here. I'm just putting my garlic away. <laughs> so they said to Rav Ashi, well, have you heard of this guy? This guy's a this guy's a playing jokes, uh, you know, playing tricks. You know, he's a, he, he, we know what he's really doing. And then ve'azil v'na'im b'mabara, and then he went and slept in a boat ve'avar l'hakisa, and then of course the boat went over to the other side of the river on Yom Tov or Shabbat or whatever it was. Ve'sayer pere ve'amar anal lemenam kamechavena, and then and went and he looked at his fields of fruit on the other side of the river to check out that everything was okay, and they said, oh yeah, I was just taking a nap in the boat. So you're not allowed to ride in a boat on Yom Tov. You're allowed to go look at your uh, field on Yom Tov if you're. If you're, if you're walking, if you're just walking around on Shabbat or Yom Tov, you're not allowed to go say, "I'm going to go do business now and look." But if you're strolling by, you're allowed to look. But to go in the boat and to travel over there, uh, you're not allowed to do. So he said, "No, no, no, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I didn't want to go on Shabbat on the boat. I was just taking a nap in the boat. And how did I know the guy was going to bring the boat over to the other side when I was lying on there?" So two things that he did that were a little bit iffy. He's doing questionable stuff. So, uh, you know, playing, uh, playing tricks and saying, nah, I didn't mean that. So Amar Lahu Ravashi defended him and said, Aramak Amrat, Aramak Bidrabanani. Both of those violations are just rabbinic violations. And since I know that he won't do it outright, he won't violate the rabbinic prohibition outright, he's allowed to engage in subterfuge around a rabbinic prohibition. Because right, sitting, sitting on a boat... Not yeah, because plugging, a, plugging a, a, a barrel with a piece of garlic is not a permanent <laughs> fix. So it's clearly not biblically prohibited. It's rabbinically prohibited. Traveling over the water on a boat on Shabbat is not biblically prohibited. It's rabbinically prohibited. So I know that he won't do it outright. So he's allowed to engage in subterfuge. But a regular person, we don't want them to do, engage in subterfuge even for rabbinic prohibitions because they won't know that they will cross a line eventually and we can't trust them. Um, so, uh, right, okay. So now the, the Mishnah says, new Mishnah, Notnin Mayim Al Gabea Shimarim Bishvil Shitzolo. If you had some dregs of wine, you can pour water over them so that they will, Shitzolo means, so that they will, uh, you know, will, the, the rest of the um, wine will flow out of them. Okay, in other words, you pour water to, you, you have dregs and you pour you water so that the, the yeah, to, to rinse them basically, yeah, so, the, so that you can get the last uh, flavor of whatever's left inside them. Um, and you can strain wine with sudarim. In other words, you can pour wine, not the dregs, but you can pour wine through a cloth. Why? Because it's not really a very discernible straining. Because if you pour wine through a cloth and it goes through to the other side, you can't really... It's like a Brita filter. You know, you can't really see the difference between water that went through the Brita filter and water that's regular water. It's not discernible. So pouring wine, pouring dregs, putting dregs in the strainer, like we said before, where the wine is going to drip out of the, the dregs, that you're not allowed to do because that's really straining. But here, when you pour wine through a cloth, it's going right through the cloth. You can't tell the difference between the wine, really, that went through the cloth and regular wine. They both look pretty much the same. And therefore, you know, it's not really considered a significant type of straining. The same is true about a reed basket that you could pour wine through that for some minimal straining. And we learned earlier, you can put an egg in the sieve that sifts the mustard. Why would they do that? They would put it, and so the yolk, the yellow yolk would yellow the mustard down below. So you, you sifted the mustard, of course, beforehand, and it's on the bottom. And so you put the yellow of an egg so that it will yellow the mustard, <laughs> give it yellow, and the white of the egg will stay on top. And as we said earlier, that wasn't really considered sifting or borer because both parts are going to be used. You're just splitting them in half, putting the yellow in one place and you take, keeping the white on top for something else. So it's not purifying. No, because you're not really purifying. You're just using each part for something else, right? Because the yellow you're using and the white you're using, yeah. On Shabbat, if you're washing fruit in a bit in your hands, that's, right. not, that's not straining. No, 
if you're washing food. You're washing it off. In a strainer. What kind of strainer? Any kind of a strainer. A strainer a that's used as a strainer. No. A colander. A colander. A colander. Are you washing the fruit? Um, I don't know because it's a good question. I would want to think about it, but like off the top of my head, you're not really straining right. out dirt. You're doing the same thing dirt. with, do with your hand. Look, right. It doesn't look different after you... You're not straining. It's like straining is when you want to separate something. You're not really straining... You're just, out. you're just washing it. It's just convenient to use the to use the bowl like that. But I don't think that you're really straining anything because straining is taking um, like uh, pasola. You're taking out something right. bad, like dregs or something. In your hand, right? That would be straining if it was straining. If you had like some mixture and you wanted to keep, you know, to to strain out the liquid from it, and you poured it through that. Definitely, you wouldn't be allowed to do that. Right. Definitely not. Washing. Like let's say you had soup and you wanted to get rid of the solids because somebody couldn't chew, so you poured the soup through the colander and then you just had the liquid on the bottom. That's and you separate. that's like a deorita of borer for sure, because then you're you're really separating two items, two things, one that you don't want, one that you want. But if you um, had a bowl of soup and you picked out the pieces of chicken, you're only allowed to pick what you chicken. want to eat. You can't take the, you can't yeah. take what you don't want. But if you were you you intended to eat all fine. of that, yeah, chicken, that's fine. You know, each of those things goes to different purposes. Right. Oh, you wanted to eat it solid, let's say, on a plate, so you took it out and you put it on the so, plate and ate so that. Uncle Joe you could, here right. can he have the soup without the chicken because he can't chew. Right. You oh, you're eating it, though. Right. Yeah, but you're eating it. Right. That would be okay. Yeah. You want. You're eating it. You, right. you can take what you want. Yeah, yeah for sure. You could just take it out and grow it for somebody else. Right. Exactly. That you can't do. So, inumlin, you can make inumlin. So, what's, this is a, some kind of spicy wine. We're going to see what the issues of making it might be. Rabbi Yehuda says you can make a cup. You can make it cup by cup on Shabbat. You can make it on Yom Tov um, uh, in larger quantities. Quantities, pitcher by pitcher, and, and on a, and chol moed you can make it even a barrel of it. Rabbi Tzadok, Omer, Akol Lefi Orchin. Rabbi Tzadok says it depends how many guests you have. We'll see more details about this upcoming. Amar um, Zerizeri says, Noten Adam Yain Salu Lomayin Tzlulin Letocha Mishamer Rabbi Shabbat. You can pour clear wine and clear water through a filter on Shabbat. No problem because you're not really filtering anything. Ve'eno Choshesh. Aval akurin lo, but if they are, if it's cloudy wine or cloudy water, and what you're doing is trying to filter out the dirt or the yuckiness out of it, then uh, you're not allowed to. Meitiv there is an objection. Rabban Shavu Gamliel lo, Rabban Shavu Gamliel says Torei Adam Chavit Shal Yain. A person can yena um, ushmara that you can you can stir. A barrel of wine, the wine and the dregs, and you can then pour it through a sieve, and it's no problem. So what's the what's the issue? The issue is that this sounds pretty much like uh, you are taking cloudy wine. You just said that cloudy wine that has dregs in it mixed in. You're not allowed to put through the sieve. What are you allowed to put through the sieve? Wine that is clear already. Clear, right. If it's clear already, like the Brita filter, that's the Brita filter, right? It's basically clear. You can't see any difference. So, but Rabban Shavu Gamliel is saying you can pour even the murky liquid through. So, how can you pour the murky liquid through? So, the Gemara answers, Tirgim Iri Ben Hagitot Chanu. This is talking about Ben Hagitot. So, Rashi explains what does between the Gitot mean. So, he says that Ben Hagitot means that Shekola Yenot Akurin Vishotinotan Bishimarehen. That at the time of the wine harvest and the wine pressing, where they had, you know, people would be actually at the wine press doing the work of the wine press, you know, it was that season, and they would drink the wine as is. They didn't wait for it to be refined. They were hanging around the wine press, they were drinking it. So they, so they didn't care that it had dregs in it. So therefore, since people were drinking it in its natural state and they didn't care, it's all relative is basically the point. If you care, in other words, if you're in a context where people are drinking it, um, let's say you had orange juice with pulp. Let's say people will drink it either way, uh, orange juice with pulp, without pulp, uh, you know. If a person is really makpeed on the pulp, some people hate the pulp, you know, so they, and they strain it out, that would be an issue. But if really everybody is drinking it however, and it doesn't matter, and, uh, so, and, and, there was, and somebody poured it through a, a strainer, that they weren't doing it because they wouldn't drink it in its natural state. They just happened to pour it through a strainer because they, they poured it through a vessel that happened to strain it. So that wouldn't be an issue, apparently. That's what it's talking about. So if it's in a situation where people are makpid, they're particular not to drink it in that state, so then the change is significant. If they're not particular to drink it not in that state, so then the change would be, um, would be insignificant. So right, right. decanting would be, the same, be covered by the same issues as uh, filtering. What do you mean? 
Well, you got uh, that's too sophisticated for me. What was it? Oh, well, let, the, let, the, let the sediment settle. Oh, 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 yeah, that's gonna come next. That's what I thought you meant. Yeah, that's that's gonna come next. Yeah, this, that, they bring that up up that case in a minute. So um, then we said misaninin etayin basudarin. You can strain the the wine through cloth. Amar Shimi barchia ubilvad shelo yase guma, but you can't make a guma. In other words, what that means is you can't make you can't set up a, a thing that has like a, a hole in it. It's not a hole. A um, a ca- sort of like a cavity, so that it looks like you made it a makeshift strainer with the cloth, and then you're pouring it through. So Rashi says, Two possibilities why you can't do that. In other words, it has to be flat. Whatever, when you pour through the cloth, it has to be flat. Why does it have to be flat? Either because making it curved is the way they would do it during the week, and it looked too, uh, it looked too much like a weekday activity, or because you might come to squeeze it out. Whereas when it's stretched taut, you can't really squeeze it, right? Because it's stretched taut. Um, th- that, that's the way that Rashi interprets it. But Kfifa Mitzrit, pouring it through a basket, Amar Rav Chiyabar Ashi, Amar Rav. Rav Chiyabar Ashi said the name of Rav. As long as you don't hold the basket over the container. Now, we're, we're talking about pouring wine through a basket, a reed basket, um, in order to strain it. And you're straining it into a container. So uh, it says as long as you don't hold the basket a tefach above the bottom of the vessel into which you're straining it. Okay? It can't be held up high. Why? So Rashi explains here, what's the reason? Because, kemidat oil, because it's like making an ohel, it's like making a temporary tent. Okay, others say that that's not the reason, that the reason is again because of uvda dechol, because it looks too much like a weekday activity, and this, by holding it really close to the vessel, it looks less um, obviously, like you're doing straining, uh, than if you hold it up in the air. A tefak from the bottom of the from vessel? From the bottom of the vessel, which means it would have to be really close. It doesn't seem like you have much space. I guess these ba- baskets were small. Oh. Uh, I, I would suppose. Um, or the cups were small. Amarav um, says, Hi, Paronka, Apalge de Kubashare, Akule Kuba Asur. If you wanted to put a cover, they would stretch over um, baskets, I'm, I'm sorry, barrels of, of beer or wine. They would stretch a cloth over the top to prevent refuse or dirt or bugs from going into it. So you can cover the, you, you can cover part of it, but you can't cover the entire thing. Again, Rashi interprets this as having to do with making a tent, making a cover over something. Um, others uh, have, uh, you know, interpreted otherwise, but that's the way that Rashi interprets it here. Um, says, a person should not put what they used to do was they would pour from the, the barrel of wine into a cup you shouldn't put like what some people would put like little sticks or things like that on the top of their cup so that it would catch the yuckiness the sediment when it would fall in yeah in their cup so when it's pouring from the barrel into their cup they would have a clean you know whatever they got would be clean you can't do that because even if it's makeshift sort of thing it's being done in order to uh, in order to filter and it's very obvious that you're filtering um the the of Papa, the in the house of Rav Papa, they used to pour beer from one container to another. This is like the decanting that you're talking about. Okay, Amar le Rav Achami Diftei le Ravina. So Rav Acham from Diftei said to Ravina, Ha'ikan nitzotzot. What about the last drops? In other words, very nice that you're pouring from one container to another. But when you get to the bottom of the container, what do you usually have? Think about your, even if you get coffee sometimes, Drinks. the grounds at the bottom, uh, you know, you have that yuckiness at the bottom. And when you're pouring out, you're going to be doing it so that only the liquid comes and you don't want the, you don't want the grounds. So what happens? So, that in the house of Rav Papa, such things were not considered significant. Rashi explains, Shechan Vani. He used to make beer and sell it, as we learned in many Masechtot. He didn't care about that. So actually, so true, it would be a problem. Okay? Um, it, it would seem like that would be a problem, normally, to separate the clear clean beer from the dregs on the bottom. But the only thing was that he was, uh, he was dealing with such a large quantity that he didn't care about that. He would just throw out the bottom of the bo- barrel anyway. So he never really did have this issue of trying to separate out uh, one from the other. Now, uh, and then it says, Utchilat shefiyatan And what does the, the Bach say on the side here? 
she'en apesol et nikar la borero that since pouring it so you might ask a question okay very good at the end of pouring out of the barrel you're telling me that he just threw it away so it's no problem he wasn't really he didn't separate the he didn't sift right he didn't do it but what about the uh, what, what about when you're pouring it in the beginning because all along you're really taking out of the dregs because if you imagine the dregs are at the bottom the whole time so anything you pour out even from the top technically you're separating it from the dregs that are below it's just that the dregs are very far at the bottom so Rashi's <coughs> explaining that it's not nikar it's not obvious that you're separating a mixture because the dregs settle at the bottom so it's only when you get really to the bottom of the barrel um, literally that you uh, recognize that there's a mixture of dregs and liquid and that you're effectively sifting out the good stuff from the bad now normally sifting out good from bad wouldn't be a problem if you're immediately going to use it but if you're using a vessel to do this or you're doing it for later right you're moving it from one container to another for later so then it would be a problem and you wouldn't be allowed to anyway so therefore basically what we learn is that pouring from one to the other is okay but at the end at the bottom of the barrel you have to be careful not to purposely separate the good liquid from the dregs especially if you're not doing it for immediate use then it's really a concern. Or if you're using any kind of vessel, any kind of a sieve or any kind of a tool to separate it, that would be a problem as well. So